Please welcome to the stage your CHI 2023 Technical Program Chairs, Tash Goyle, Anisha Peters, and Per Ola Christensen. So here we are, and at the moment, we are just all waiting for the final moments of Kai. However, in the background, we still have a lot of emails going around that our ABLE uh, TPC assistants are handling. So we want to say thank you very much to them. And one of the final things that we would like to do is actually to announce the awards. And for the um, first um, student design competition, the winners were Agapet supporting a responsible adoption process for stray and abandoned pets in urban areas by Mei Jin Zhang and Gabriel Canarte. And the runner-up was Robote, interactive educational tool to teach basic education children to classify and collect waste in their school environment by Nadia Jimenez, uh, Belen um, Hernandez. <laughs> then the winners for the student game competition was for category one, um, under innovative interfaces, Medusa, a view tracking Pong game by Nikolai Lukas Reinke, Thomas, Tobias Wursthorn, and Jan Jessen. <laughs> and for category two, transformative and transgressive play category, Breathero, not another slow breathing game, exploring faster paced VR breathing exercise games by Xing Yu Wang, Cha Yu Cheng, Xu Meng Wang, Wang Luo Cheng, Yu Xiong Yuang, and Ji Wei Lin. Thanks, Anisha. Uh, on to the student research competition. Um, we have two categories in this, uh, category one undergraduates and category two graduates, starting with the undergraduates. Um, the first prize goes to animated patterns, applying dynamic patterns to vector illustrations by Joshua Yang. <laughs> the second prize goes to which factors predict the chat experience of a natural language generation dialogue service by Ezen Chen. And the third one is Coco, design and evaluation of a wearable pet that supports composting habits towards an interaction design for empathy by Debbie Jung. Category two, graduates. Um, the first prize is anonymous online support, investigations of identity and heterogeneous groups in online recovery support by Matthew Zent. The second one is Long Zal, a longitudinal search as learning study with university students by Nilavra Bhattacharya. And the third one is Contrasting Technologists and Activists' Positions on Signing Avatars by Robin Angelini. Uh -oh. 
Is this thing working? We'll just smile. All right. So I hope you've enjoyed the wonderful interactivity, which I think is beginning to rival SIGGRAPH emerging technologies, and soon we'll beat it in a few years, I'm sure. And on that note, let us introduce the Interactivity Awards, if we can go to the next slide. Can we? All right, so the jury's best demo recognition, the winner is MOFA, exploring asymmetric mixed reality design strategy for co-located multiplayer between handheld and head-mounted augmented reality. And it's by Boutua Hu, Yushan Zhang, Xishan Hao, and Yilan Tao. And we have two honorable mentions. The first one is uh, versatile, immersive, virtual, and augmented, tangible OR, using VR, AR, and tangibles to support surgical practice. And it's by Anke Verena Reinschusser, Thomas Munder, Roland Fischer, Valentin Kraft, Verena Nicole Uslar, Dirk Wey, Andrea Schenk, Gabriel Sackmann, Tanja Döring, and Reinor Malaka. And the second honorable mention goes to Demonstrating Fluito, a playful flotation tank experience by Maria Montoya, Yu Zhang Ji, Sarah, Pei, Sarah Jane Pell, and Florian Mueller. And the people's choice for best demo, the winner is Design and Fabrication of Body-Based Interfaces. The demo by Saarland HCI Lab by Jürgen Steimler, Marie Mühlhaus, Madalina Luciana Nicolet, Aditya Shekhar Nitala, Narjes Puyafin, Adwait Charma, Mark Teisler, Marian Köller, Bruno Fruckard, and Paul Strohmeyer. And again, there are two honorable mentions. The first one is The Art of Privacy, a theatrical privacy installation in virtual reality by Frederike Jung, Jona Noll Kaiser, Kai von Holt, Wilke Hoyten, and Jochen Meyer. And the second honorable mention is uh, Towards More Inclusive and Accessible Virtual Reality, Conducting Large-Scale Studies in the Wild by Teresa Schmelter, Lucie Kruse, Sukran Karasu Mangolo, Sebastian Rings, Frank Steinecke, and Christian Hildebrand. And now we'd like to welcome the general shares on the stage. Eins, zwei, drei, vier, fünf. Sechs, sieben, acht, neun, aus. Here we are, we made it. <laughs> so. <laughs> One word of advice for volunteering. So, if you volunteer, volunteer for general chair. <laughs> and only if you're really brave, volunteer for assistant. We yeah. want to thank our two assistants. Alisa is giving birth soon, and uh, Passant is here, so you can thank her in person. We want to really thank our assistants. So, indeed, here we are, almost at the end of CHI, and of course we hope that uh, all of you have really enjoyed reconnecting uh, in this uh, event. We have really enjoyed it, and I, 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 we hope you realize that it's really you who make CHI happen. And now we uh, watch at the uh, short video of, of this week.
And it's not only us who enjoyed Kai. We have yesterday looked into the uh, children's room or the children's rooms, and it was amazing. We had 80 kids registered for Kai, and the fun they had was amazing. So thank you for all of those who brought their kids, who, who dared to bring their kids to, the, to Kai, and also for those who organized making it happen. And next, we want to thank people without whom uh, the whole conference wouldn't happen. You probably know, and if you don't, uh, uh, we really want to emphasize that student volunteers are really the backbone of CHI. So they have really, they, we had more than 200, uh, 200 uh, student volunteers this year, and they have worked for countless hours with a wonderful attitude. They have been so super helpful to all of us, and, and like I said, uh, without them, Kai wouldn't happen. So please, SVs, either wave or stand up, and let's give a round of applause to our wonderful SVs. And there are more people who are making Kai what it is. Kai is a volunteer-led organization, so we have the student volunteers. We have a large organizing committee. Please wave, stand up, wherever you are. We have the program committee, the technical program committee. We have the reviewers, and the numbers of reviews, the number of lines of reviews written, it's just it's, it's huge when you look at it. So a, a round of applause for everybody who helped to make Kai, to make the technical program, to make it happen here. Okay, and now uh, we invite uh, Elizabeth Churchill, our keynote chair to introduce the, the closing keynote. Well, thank you so much. I am so excited to uh, introduce our closing keynote. Um, our closing keynote is Peter Kariuki. And hopefully you saw the video at the beginning of the conference. But if you didn't, just a few words before he comes up here. Um, he's a self-taught software engineer, a hacker, and an entrepreneur. He's lived in more than 10 countries in Africa, and has had, he's got a really keen eye for what people need and want. And he's sort of had all of these different diverse experiences. I asked him if he would share a little bit more about himself so that I don't take up too much time here, and he's going to do that. And I do want you to ask, ask him questions, so please use the QR code to get questions into Slido. And uh, I'm going to keep it so short because I can't wait to invite Peter up here. Come on, Peter. Africa was late to the digital economy but it is rapidly catching up and being transformed by it. There are many opportunities which are disguised as challenges, and I believe these are invitations for innovative designs. To design products for African users, we have to pay close attention to the local context in which they use, who is using them, and for what they're using it for. I'm excited to be here at Kai and to be a part of this community. I'd like to share with you my story and my experience that I've learned in launching digital products in Africa. I come from a small village in Kenya called Engineer. It is, <laughs> <laughs> as you can see, it's a real place. <laughs> it's nestled at the foothills of the Abadares, and my family lived in a farming community where Roosters woke you up in the morning, and cows mooing and sheep bleeding. That was, that was our background music. 
As a young boy, I spent many hours obsessing over ways to get more power, as we, our only source of power was our car battery. We only had one channel on the television, and with my brother and sisters as lookouts, I would spend many hours trying to take it apart and to put it back in time for my parents to come back. Mobile phones came to my village when I was about five years old. These were very basic phones, and to make a call, we had a spot, designated spots. It was either a hill, it had to be a high spot. And calls were reserved for special circumstances because the only place to charge the, the phone was over two kilometers away. The first time I saw a computer, I was awestruck. Fellow kids at school were playing Wolf 3D, and I watched them use the trackball with such dexterity, and seeing messages like, it is now safe to turn off your computer, that was a strange thing for me. One day, I was sent to the local print shop, which had the only computer in town. And this was the day that changed my life. There sat a man who was studying computer science in university, and he showed me something cool. He wrote a program that animated an object in 2D space. Programming was a very foreign concept to me, and it had never occurred to me that a normal human being, an engineer, could command a computer to their will. I became a frequent visitor to the shop, and I convinced the student who was studying computer science to share his materials with me. When no one was looking, I printed hundreds of pages of documentation without paying. <laughs> a few months later, uh, during a school holiday, my dad called me in. And there sat the owner of the print shop, spilling the beans on how I have been printing documents without paying. I had a lot of explaining to do for my dad to foot the $100 bill. At the time, this devastated me, but a seed had been planted firmly in my mind. It seemed as if in the world of software, it was unlimited. You could build whatever you want. I was inspired to pursue a career in technology and to use it to be a driver for social change and economic growth. My experiences growing up shaped how I think about designing products for especially African users. I'm inspired by the power that technology brings and the opportunities that it creates for individuals and communities. Fast forward 20 years later, and technology, connectivity, and network have transformed my hometown of Engineer. It's incredible to think that just 60 years ago, my grandfather was fighting for independence from the British. And now we have a WhatsApp group with my family where I get to see what everybody had for lunch. Engineer is still a small place, but there's many towns like it. If you look across the continent, you will see an explosion in connectivity, technology, all around the continent. One of these great transformation is in financial services. In many ways, Kenya is leading the world in innovations in mobile banking and mobile money, thanks to innovations like M-Pesa in Kenya. M-Pesa made it as easy as sending a text message, uh, sending money as easy as sending a text message. It's, it's, it's great on paper, but it's actually even more incredible when you see it uh, in, 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 the real, in the real world, because they manage to include everybody and it's accessible for all. I remember when m came to my village. We weren't able to use banks because of minimum deposits and fees, and so, because my family had a shop, the money that they would earn we had a designated hiding spot. It was a family secret. And when M-Pesa came, we were, people were running to put all the money in M-Pesa. It's a great example of an innovation that was able to be available for all. 
Moreover, in this same period, Africa's population has, has exploded. With a median age of just 19 years old, Africa is so young that by the end of the century, most of the world's children will be in Africa. Young people are the driving force behind much of the continent's transformation. In this same time, mobile phones have come to the continent and they've become the primary device that most young people will use. These are cheap, powerful Android smartphones that have just exploded in the continent. While connectivity and access has been growing, there's still a large part of the population that is left behind. This is, you can have access to network, but you're not able to get online yourself for many reasons. So it's, it's, we can't overstate the importance of equal access for technology for all. At the same time, because of the rapid transformation of Africa, a lot of the design languages that have just come to the continent do not necessarily translate well to the African context. For many users who may not be familiar with Western culture and languages. For example, why does an X mean close? Why is it that a floppy disk sign is, it, it means save? We cannot assume a technology legacy for our users because, because they, they just kind of walked into the world of smartphones. There's now over 500 million smartphones on the continent. And with the rise of smartphones as a primary device for getting online and accessing the internet, we need to think about mobile design and we need to optimize for touch experiences. We have to pay close attention to how our products are used as well. To deploy successfully, we have to think about technology being used in a low resource setting. For example, many users use data like a light switch, where they will only turn it on when they need it and off uh, at other times. This is because data is still expensive. And speaking of light switches, because power is often unavailable, those sometimes don't go on. Uh, we had how that could save your company. I have had the pleasure of visiting and being and working in many African countries and launching digital products. The journey has felt as one of going through the jungle with a machete in hand and cutting your way through it. I would like to share some of those projects with you. In Kigali, there is a bus station at the periphery of the city called Nyabugogo. Every day, over tens of thousands of passengers visit the, the station to buy tickets to go to various destinations. I was brought in to design a, a fleet, fleet management system and ticketing system for the bus companies. The idea was, okay, let's take a point-of-sale system, it will connect to the cloud and to work. We designed the system with that in mind, and when we launched it, we quickly noticed many issues. As part of understanding the, the challenges that were faced, we camped at the bus station and traveled with, with the bus drivers around the country, and sometimes we'd sell tickets ourselves. What we noticed is that connectivity would sometimes drop off. There would be places where there would be dead zones with no connectivity at all. Furthermore, for most people, when they were buying their tickets, they were buying for the next bus. So they were impatiently queuing and needed the system to work really quickly. Users were also not familiar with a point of sale system and they needed further handholding to be able to use the system. With this lessons learned, we went back to the drawing board and redesigned the system. One of the things we did was we enabled the system to work offline fast and to reconcile in the background. We also utilized multiple SIM cards for failover so that when one SIM card would fail, 
the network would automatically go on to the next one. One of the technologies that is really exciting and that we utilize is something called USSD. For those who may not be familiar with USSD, it allows for interactive menus, programmable, that you can use on any type of phone, even a feature phone. It's how most of m and mobile money is deployed across the continent. Users could go on to the USSD system and pre-book their tickets, pay with mobile money to avoid the situation where they have to queue in line. These changes were part of the reasons why we were able to sign up the bus companies and the government even made a policy to force the bus companies to use an electronic ticketing system. Now, I haven't seen any motorcycle taxis here in Hamburg, but they are the primary way of moving around in Africa. There's over five million motorcycle taxis in, in Africa, whether it's a border in East Africa, a Wewe in Kinshasa, or a Okada in West Africa. They represent one of the largest informal employers on the continent, and they're a cog to many personal and business activities. In Kigali, like many African cities, the way you get one is you go to the road and you flag somebody down and you take them to your destination. It's an excellent test of trust because you do not know who the driver is, you don't know how old they are, and you don't know if this is their first day on the job. As a result, they are extremely dangerous, and many hospitals will have a, a wing just for motorcycle-related accidents, injuries. One day in Kigali, I took one to meet a friend, and immediately after taking him, I realized that he had no sense of balance or speed control. As we were heading off to a destination, I was begging him to slow down and be careful. And when I arrived where I was going, meeting a friend, we wished if there was a way to know if the, the quality of the driver ahead of time. We had, <laughs> we had many ideas. Let us put the sensors in the helmet. Let us track them via satellite. But eventually, the idea that won was we realized that all the sensors we needed were in a medium-range smartphone. We utilized the, the gyroscopes, the accelerometer, and other sensors in the phone to track how they were driving, to gauge their driving behavior. We, had, we put a video online, and we... It was picked up by an Irish investor who was investing in transportation, uh, transportation startups. They sent us one of those emails uh, we had in the opening keynote. It said, we like your idea. If you apply here, you might get funding and resources to come here. After our initial skepticism, we applied and we got in and moved to Ireland to build our product. We built it there, and in Ireland, there was, you know, there was perfect maps, the connectivity always worked, people always had high-end phones, and after three months of working there, we were ready, and we moved back to Rwanda to launch the product. We fell flat on our face. Well, map, map data in a place like Ireland was excellent. A lot of Rwanda was still unmapped. There was many places, such as informal settlements, that did not have an accurate uh, mapping structure. We had to go back to the drawing board to think about how we would get uh, customers and drivers uh, paired together. Eventually, we launched Safe Motors in Rwanda, and over time, expanded it to Kinshasa. Kinshasa is the capital of the D Democratic Republic of Congo. It is both a marvel and a terror. For those who might be familiar with, with Kin, it is one of those cities that lives up to its reputation. When we arrived there, what we saw were traffic clogged streets, lack of trust among users, no way to move around. And these were perfect, a perfect environment for us to launch Safe Motors at. 
While I thought I understood the needs for safe motors intellectually, it became personal one day. As I was exploring the city uh, of Kinshasa, I was walking around, visiting the zoo with ideas ringing in my head about product, telematics, and launch expansion. I visited a zoo, and outside, I found a driver who looked decently dressed. He looked like he had come from church. So I took the driver and instructed him to my destination. A few meters away from the destination, he swerved away and started driving into oncoming traffic. My desperate screams for help fell on deaf ears, and I realized that he was up to no good, and I had to get myself out of this situation. After what seemed like eternity, he slowed enough for me to jump off his bike and run to safety. This left me badly wounded and cost me my front teeth. But I did make it to the hospital on time. And I was, as I was lying there in the emergency room on the far end of a morgue, it became clear that this issue of road safety was deadly serious. A couple of months later, we launched Safe Motors in Kinshasa, and our drivers completed over three million trips with none requiring an emergency room visit. While we set off to revolutionize the motorcycle industry in, in Africa, we learned a lot of lessons along the way, and I would like to share some with you. For example, at the core of a ride-hailing application is the ability to route users together from one place to the other. How, how would you do that? You would get a GPS lock. Now, what we found is that because most people have low-end smartphones, you can get a GPS location that is almost accurate, but the window is too big. So in a hilly place like Kigali, that can mean a difference of five minutes or 10 minutes uh, on, a different, on a different road. Furthermore, we found that many people were unfamiliar with map interfaces and are unable to recognize, recognize the map uh, interface that they have. What we did was we started utilizing a database of points of interest so we would direct the, the driver to say, go to this point of interest, triangulate yourself, and there will be textual directions to give you more instruction on how you go. Some of them would read, you know, arrive at this, uh, at this building and take a left turn in a blue gate by the tree. And it worked. It worked, and many people were able to connect uh, with the drivers themselves. While we'd look at our funnels, we would see that a lot of people would download the app, create an account, but very few would end up requesting a ride. We tried to understand what was going on by doing surveys and asking people in the streets, but that, those did not bring any right answers. So we ended up deciding to, to have an idea. Let us pick 20 people who have never used the product, let us put them in a room, and let us observe uh, how, they, how they work on various tasks. And we sat in the other room, nervously watching. What we found out was majority of our users were unable to complete even basic tasks. The design language was foreign, they didn't recognize icons, and it was incredible that very few people were able to complete the task that we've put in. When we were interviewing the users uh, after that, some of them said that they were embarrassed. They were embarrassed because they were unable to figure out. Now, as a product designer, I don't think you set off to embarrass your users. And that dawned on us that we had been disrespecting our users. We had to get back again to the drawing board and make some design changes. 
One of them was when instead of relying on just the GPS lock that we get, we would instruct them, go on outside, walk outside the window, and uh, put your phone uh, outside, and you can get a better GPS lock uh, yourself. This also, we applied the same idea for the, for the drivers. Because the drivers would get rated on their, on their safety score, what we started doing was, if a driver did not meet a certain score, they would get cut off. But then we changed that by bringing in the drivers who had a low score and pairing them with a driver who had a high score. By having them explain their ideas in context and to say, this is how you maintain a high score, we were, we were amazed by how quickly they were able to improve their scores going forward. The system of having users help each other was a great idea that we applied when we went to Kinshasa. We hired a, a, a team of street teams where people would stand on the street and they would flag users down and they would explain to them how to use the products. By hand-holding the users and taking them through the journey for the fast, uh, for the fast ride, they were able to learn how to use the system themselves and, and understand how the system works. I wanted to share another example of a great innovation that works in context. For a lot of, for a lot of medical uh, installations in Africa, they still rely on paper-based paper -based records. Well, the data that is in those records is valuable and can be utilized for a lot of purposes. It is expensive to hire teams of people to enter the data itself. This company called PaperMR uh, utilizes a, a stamp where a form that has been structured and preset ahead of time can be stamped onto the records and a picture can be taken and that data is automatically extracted extracted and to be utilized in, in, a, in a dashboard uh, situation. What we hear about all the advances of artificial intelligence, I, I like innovations like this because it's about it being used in context and it solving a, a major problem that is faced. Reflecting on all the experiences across Africa and with launching products, I am motivated by the power that technology has in solving problems that matter. I am turning my attention to a new challenge. This is the rising rates of non-communicable diseases on the continent. Over the last 20 years, there has been great innovations in primary care and infectious diseases. But right now, we're experiencing a transition where Non-communicable diseases such as diabetes and hypertension have become the leading causes of death. It's been great to be here at CHI and to see great examples of innovations that are looking into addressing these issues. It was amazing to see how interventions, when presented at the right time for the safe motorist drivers, were able to help them change their behavior and to become safer drivers. And I'm excited to explore such ideas and how they translate into, into health, into the healthcare space. Africa is a rapidly changing continent. And there are a lot of unique opportunities which are disguised as challenges. And when you look across the continent, you see there's over 1,000 200 digital platforms that have come up, mostly by local Africans, to solve problems that they see and have. Designing products for African users requires a deep understanding of the context and the context in which they're used. Sometimes you have to build so much around, around your product as there are few, few legacy systems to build on top of. 
I think that this presents an opportunity for us to think from first principles and at each layer think uh, of, of, of a different way that it can be. And I believe that it's layer by layer is how ecosystems are built. Technology is at our fingertips. We're living in, in the age of AI, and it feels like a lifetime of science fiction has been building up to this. And there's no shortage of opportunities to design inclusive and meaningful solutions that can have impact on people. This community has, been, has shaped how we use technology today, and now an opportunity is in front of us, designing for the future, which I believe is increasingly African. I invite the problem solvers in the audience to pick a problem, design inclusively, imagine a new reality, become it long enough for, to change the world. We Africans are motivated to, to work together. You will find energy to draw from, a spirit of optimism, and an entrepreneurial spirit, which I believe are the core ingredients for real change. I would like to end with the words of John Muir, who says, the power of imagination makes us infinite. Thank you very much for your attention and look forward to your thoughts and ideas. Peter, thank you so, so much. Um, that was an absolutely wonderful talk, and you know, you and I have had a couple of chats, um, so I had some of the bones of what you were talking about, but it's so good to see the full stories shared. And uh, Peter was sharing earlier that he's really enjoyed meeting people in this community and already feels part of it and wants to uh, you know, make sure that we uh, continue to have dialogue. And uh, one of the things about our community is they're quite pushy, and so what this question actually is really for the steering committee, but you might get uh, inveigled into this. <laughs> when are we hosting Kai at the Kigali Convention Center? <laughs> <laughs> it's, more seriously, that's a great question, and steering committee, we're on it. Um, but I'm gonna ask you a, a, a question which is about specific content. Um, what would you recommend for non-African researchers on their research journey with African users? For non-African researchers uh, to understand the context uh, of Africa, I believe that the most powerful way is to be there and to look outside the window. And you will notice a lot of, a lot of things that you might not you might not get elsewhere. I believe that if you're in context, you will get a lot of color into how, and most importantly, why. Why things are done in a certain way. And it's impossible to get that elsewhere. And I think a lot of great ideas come from just being at the right place at the right time and noticing, noticing what, what can be different. That's great. Thank you. Oops. Um, there, there's so many good questions. I just have to choose one of them. Um, maybe I'll start with this one. Um, you, you talked about M-Pesa. Um, M-Pesa started in Africa and disrupted money payments globally. Um, I know it's definitely come around in India and has changed the world in India as well. What future disruptions do you expect from the African continent that will change the world? I am excited about the potential for technology to solve meaningful problems. Now, M-Pesa was a great transformation of the financial industries, 
And smartphones as well have been, they have changed how we connect, how we talk, and a lot of, a lot of utility is coming out of that. Now, what I'm excited about is we have this great platform of innovation, and we have many, many challenges still, whether it's you know, around climate change or around healthcare or education. And what I would like to see is the smartphone be having more utility in addressing the, the serious challenges that are there. Everybody is online, everybody is online on a powerful phone. So what is it that we can create that addresses all these challenges and help solve them? Thanks. Hi, Peter. As a fellow African, I really appreciate your talk. However, people might have noticed that I had to put my phone and take pictures from his Slido because my phone doesn't update. I don't know. It's supposed to be a great phone, but anyways. <laughs> so um, I chose a question from Humphrey Curtis, um, and this question is, with the comparatively smaller data footprint of Africa and growth in AI um, and LLMs, are you concerned AI and its biases will push Africa further behind? It's been, it's been great to see the, the recent uh, advancements in artificial intelligence, and especially around uh, large language models and large uh, image models. While I believe that a lot of, we have a lot of excitement, and this is because the timing has, has just clicked where we have enough data, enough processing power to be able to start to extract value from these models. I do believe that, yes, these models will represent the data that is fed to them and to represent a lot of the historical biases that we have. So the, I believe that the diversity of the of the process, whether it's the people annotating the data or the data that is being collected, eventually gets represented in the outputs of these models. So I think today we can have so much more representation in these models, and there is a question of where that data comes from, and I believe that eventually we have to think about all kinds of uh, where, what type of data we fit in and what type of biases and representations does it, does it end up outputting. Thank you. Thank you again. Super inspiring talk, really. And I'm sure it's a question that was very highly voted that also resonated with me. And that's essentially, what would you recommend for non-African researchers for us to engage with a user uh, research journey in Africa? What should we do? What are your tips and tricks? Mm -hmm. I would, I would, I would to all the researchers uh, out here uh, who are interested in the continent, I invite you to go there and visit the many places. What you will see is there, there's a certain story that is represented, but you will see so much more when you're there. And you, there's a lot of diversity across city to city, country to country, and problems sometimes transfer across, across borders, but most of the times they're unique. It's either because of local cultural sensitivities or just the history of the place. So if you can set foot in there, you will, I believe that you will see so much more and there's so much value to be uh, extracted and created in there. So, you know, it's uh, people interested in technology. We tend to want to build lots and lots and lots of things. And I think this is a wonderful question because uh, someone asks, what should we not build for the African context? What should we not try to go and, you know, create? That is, that is interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I think for the African continent has had a, a bad track record of having a lot of value extraction instead of creation. So I think, uh, you know, to, to shift away and say that, I believe that we need to have the lens of 
what kind of value can we create, rather what can we extract. So when we're building products and thinking about projects, I think we need to apply that lens and say there is a great capacity, a great human resource capacity, there is a great platform for innovation, people are online, so what is it that we can create that brings value to, to the continent? That's a really good answer, and I have to follow up with a very similar question. Um, so I apologize first. Uh, someone asks, um, are there any areas where you feel technology has been harmful? And it's a good question, right? So, such as appending existing practices or locking individuals out of these new digital systems, perhaps? Any examples you can maybe share with us? Yeah. I think that there are some areas that have been that have been harmful in the development of technology across the continent. Since now everybody is online and we are consuming, uh, everybody consumes their information from the, from the internet. Uh, as a result of that, there's been a lot of bad actors that have come in. I'll share an example. I was in um, Kinshasa, um, I was in Brazzaville, which is a city that is across the river from Kinshasa during the last election. Um, the government of the DRC shut down the internet there, but over in Brazzaville, you could still access uh, the internet. Um, as the election continued, and we were online on social media, we could see a lot of fake news and disinformation coming, coming there, uh, trying to support a losing candidates uh, to win. So this is just one example, but there are other examples where these platforms, as we are getting connected and we're not, people are not able yet to discern a lot of the information in front of them, and there is huge capacity, opportunities for bad actors to present disinformation, and this message is spread like wildfire, where everybody spreads around. And so that, is, that has been a, a harmful uh, output of technology, uh, I believe. So there is a very recent question here. So you've been at Kai, right? Mm -hmm. So a natural question to ask, and I can't believe you haven't asked it already. Mm -hmm. What did you like about Kai? <laughs> <laughs> I, it's been incredible to be at Kai. I, I feel like I found my tribe. <laughs> so, <laughs> Uh, somebody told me that Kai is people who care about computers and also people. And it's been amazing to just see a lot of brilliant ideas uh, all around and innovations. And to see, I, I went to the interac interactions um, demos and it was, it was incredible to see how people are reimagining how we interact with computers and not just in the traditional kind of you know, 2D screen view, so it's been a great uh, diversity of ideas and uh, it's been excellent. So, I found a question from Shaima Lassim. Great talk, I admire that you chose a human-centered approach um, of how you see users um, and do you see a role of the human computer interaction African community in the next 10 years? How do you see that role? Yeah, I, I believe, again, the message of having, having this deep understanding of the context of, the play, of, of being there and seeing, understanding what, where are the people coming from, what, is, what drives, what motivates them, what kinds of problems do they care about. And I think the, this community of people who care about human-computer interaction, having a global footprint and having boots on the ground that are sending in reports on what, it, what is it like on the ground, I think that is the opportunity that, that, that we have of having these different voices represented and having these unique perspectives uh, represented as technology becomes more, more and more part of our lives. 
Thanks. Talking about perspectives, and as a non-African researcher myself, this question really resonates with me. Do you think non-African researchers should do research in Africa, or should this challenge be left to local researchers? I am a believer in perspectives. I believe that we all have a, a perspective to bring, and there is something that, given the, story, the stories that we've been told and that have brought us to where we are, can give us an opportunity to see something that others might miss. And I believe that there is, there is no borders to knowledge, and I invite all non-African researchers to, 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 to go there. And you can imagine a different reality by, by combining your experiences of seeing something that has worked elsewhere and imagining how it could work in, in, a, in, a, in a low resource setting. I believe that is the, the opportunity for having these diverse representations uh, in, this, in this field. Um, Veeam, Veeam, I'm not sure how to say the name, asks, I'm a North African here. I wonder if you've had any pushback from the currently used system refusing change or any kind of you know, pushback that you, resistance to some of the things that you've been trying to, to bring to life. Yes, I, I believe that people do resist change and especially when something is, is new and different. Uh, I'll give an example for the bus companies, uh, they were, in, in, in previous times, they would use paper receipts, mm -hmm. and those paper receipts gave, gave them a lot of loopholes for, for fraud. They would print their own receipt books and collude with the drivers to sell their tickets. Now, bringing an electronic ticketing system that brings efficiency and here, new technology, would be completely resisted because we're closing out their loopholes. And I think at the beginning, there's always that resistance, but with enough time and once, once people have seen what can be, then, then the, there's a shift. And you know, when we look back at how things were, it, seemed, it, it seems completely weird that we, were, we would do that. So I think it takes time and it takes a lot of education, and, and, but with time, change, change is the only thing that is constant. Yes, I do have a question here from Jay-Z Zinn, um, and the question is, what are the things that people often get wrong when trying to design for an African user's context, and what do you recommend designers do to avoid these issues? I think one of the, one of the, 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 the things that people might miss is that for Africa is so young, and for most people, uh, an Android smartphone is the first device that they will be interacting with. They didn't use Windows XP or Windows 95. They're going straight into a smartphone, and therefore, the, they don't have this legacy of, of all this technology that has been used before, and therefore, we can't make any assumptions about that they will recognize the design languages that we present in front of, in front of them. I believe the, the way to address this is to pay close attention to how your product is used. If you are able to observe what people do with your products, you will see these this nuances and you will be surprised by what people do uh, that is completely different from what it was designed for. So I have my own question, and I, I was struck by the fact that they, the people use mobile phones as the primary computing device, and some people say the primary computing device may change. So you like the interactivity here with uh, the non-2D interfaces, virtual and augmented reality. So some people predict that the next mobile phone platform might be augmented reality glasses, right, that everybody can wear. I'm just very curious about your thoughts about that. Would that change the way people would do interaction design in Africa, in particular, in some particular way? I think that the, the rate of uh, transformation in Africa happens so quickly, and Africans are early adopters, and I think that we were quick to you know, jump from, from you know, no phones to phones, and we would gladly accept 
innovations in virtual reality and augmented reality. I think the opportunities there, I, I th in the opportunities around there in education and you know, in representations of cultures, of history are unlimited and it's just a platform and if it is affordable and it scales on, on the continent, what's going to happen is that people will jump on the ship and create, uh, create a lot of products that lead to more adoption uh, on this. Um, There's a really interesting question. Um, your stories um, sound perhaps unintentional um, neo-colonialism. For example, the floppy disk icon that you were sharing, the closed box, you know. Um, perhaps the cloud architecture as well. What is the path, according to you, to decolonize technology? I think that there, there is this conversation that's going on around digital decolonization because right now, a lot of the products that we use are global and they, they're designed elsewhere and they work across the world. At the same time, the, the data and the teams are not normally in the place uh, over there. And I think the, right now, all the digital companies that are arising on the continent are leading this charge because it's, these people can understand the real needs of the people who are there but at the same time, they, they bring all these additional benefits around the ecosystems that are built uh, around, around this. So I think that the, the future of products being designed locally and ecosystems developing is, is, is the way to go. So one last question, which is, I don't know, wanted you to riff a little bit. I'm so excited about your new project uh, within the healthcare space. Um, if there were calls to action you could, could give to us as a community to do, the, what kinds of things could we do to help to support that kind of very local contextual activity that you're involved in? If you were coming, you know, if you were going to look at all of the papers at CHI or coming next year, what would you like to have seen some of us maybe attend to? I'm, I'm really excited about uh, the area of health, and especially because it, it affects us all. And one area that uh, I think this community can contribute is uh, the be thinking about there's all this data that is being collected and available on, uh, around healthcare. So whether it's doctor visits or it's vitals that are being checked. So how can we utilize all of this data to map behaviors and do behavior uh, matching, and once we identify certain patterns, what kind of interventions can we present uh, to people that helps them improve their health? And I think the mapping of that interaction of how somebody lives their life uh, connected with all the data sources and what does, it, what does the future look like where where we're able to give the right information at the right time in context that helps somebody improve their health. Well, Peter, I think this is a really good place, health and well-being, as a call to action for us all to practice, if not research, I think is a wonderful uh, area and message. Uh, and want to say thank you so much. Everybody, please join me in thanking Peter. Please welcome the CHI Steering Committee Chair, Cliff Lampy. Uh, yeah. All right, well, thank you all very much. Wonderful keynote, we appreciate it. Uh, let me get Albert and Kaisa up here again one last time. Round of applause for them a second. I can, 
I can tell you from personal experience that being an organizer for Kai is one of the most beautiful and tumultuous experiences one can have. And you both have done a wonderful job, and we appreciate it as a community, along with all of your volunteer organizers. Thank you all very much for making Kai happen. I wasn't hiding, I was going for a present. So we, we got you these steins because on top of being great organizers, your joy for life is stunning. I have never been to a party where both of you have not outlasted me by hours. Uh, you're, you're, we appreciate how much uh, celebration you bring to this conference and hopefully these are never empty again. Aww, thank, thank you. you. No, I think. We have oh, oh. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I, I think we, no, 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 no. I think we should go, but I think we don't want to. Yeah. I think what we want is, I think we want a selfie with you. So let's go to the middle and let's take a selfie. And I think we want to have our assistance. All right, please give them a great background for this selfie. <laughs> That's right. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you as well to all of the presenters, the authors who have done so much work, uh, the members of this community. I've seen nothing but kindness and respect and joy at this conference. Kai 2023 really did manage to reconnect us, and that was a wonderful thing to witness. Um, but now it's my pleasure to welcome Kai 2024 to the stage. Let me welcome your general chairs, Joachim George and Florian uh, Floyd Mueller, your technical program chairs, we have Karina Sass and Julia Williamson, and then your papers chairs, we have Phoebe Toops Dugas, we have Irina Shlovsky, and we have Max L. Wilson. Welcome and thank you to the volunteers for Kai 2024 in Hawaii, USA. As they say in Hawaii, aloha. We are welcome you to join us uh, next year in wonderful Hawaii and uh, respecting their cultural traditions and uh, joining us in a conference whose motto is surfing the world. The uh, conference will be from the 11th to the 16th of May. And uh, while we know it's far for many, it's also closer for people like me from the Australasia region. Um, realizing that Kai is going to be more open to the world. Furthermore, furthermore it's um, also an acknowledgement and um, a thank you to all the local companies that supported us when Kai 2020 was cancelled and encouraged us to come back. In our quest to balance work and life, we will also support hybrid attendance for those who like to join us remotely. We have all the tracks that you love at Kai. The submission deadlines are on our website. It's just 140 days until the paper's deadline, so start planning now. We have a short promo video for you from the local tourism board to help you get a little excited about the trip.
want to thank the wonderful committee for CLI 2024. Please stand up. They will be working hard to make CLI 24 a great experience. So that just leaves me to say, we look forward to seeing as many of you as possible next year. Thank <laughs> you.